It is my great honor and pleasure to present today's speaker, Dr. Sylvia Svarts Linda, who's a research associate at the Institute für Indologie und Zentralasien Wissenschaften of the University of Leipzig, research fellow at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, affiliated with the Jacques Tradition's research program. Her interests focus on the tantric religious traditions of the Sri Vidya and of the Pancharatra, specifically on the philosophical and theological doctrines expressed in the relevant South Asian Sanskrit textual traditions. Her book publications include the philosophical and theological teachings of the Padma Sanghita, published by the Verlag der Österreichischen Akademie der Wissenschaften in Vienna in 2014, and her important new book on the goddess, the goddess traditions in India, theological poems and philosophical tales in the Tripura Rahasya in the Routledge Hindu Studies series, which we all look very much forward to. And now I would like to pass the word on to you, Sylvia. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank very much the organizers of these uh, series of lectures uh, to invite me to participate to this, these lectures. So I begin my <clears throat> lecture. The title is uh, Tantric Elements Embedded in a Puranic Context, the example of the Mahatmya Kanda of the Tripura Rahasya. The Tripura Rahasya, the secret doctrine of the goddess Tripura, is a Sanskrit work of South Indian origin, probably composed between the 13th and the 16th century current era, if not later, and associated with the Shakta tradition of Tripura, uh, later known as Sri Vidya. The uh, Tripura Rahasya's affiliation is detectable in the philosophical teachings of the work, which, uh, like those of the Yogini Hridaya, a se seminal source for this tradition, uh, are clearly indebted <clears throat> to the Kashmirian Shaiva non dualism of the Pratyabhikmya. In my contributions to the second and the third Shakta Symposia, uh, at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, I had analyzed some of the doctrinal teachings of the Tripura Rahasya, expounded in passages from both the Mahatmya Kanda and the Jnana Kanda, which are the two extant sections of the work. This lecture will focus on some tantric ritual elements embedded in the Puranic-like mythic narrative of the Mahatmya Kanda, which celebrate the deeds of Tripura and of the goddesses who are regarded as her manifestations or shares, Amsha. Uh, besides the relevant statements found in the doctrinal passages of the text, the Mahatmya Kanda provides three chief pieces of evidence testifying to an affiliation with the Sri Vidya, namely, <clears throat> First, the description of the initiation uh, ceremony, the Diksha. Second, the revelation of the mantra of the goddess. And third, the instruction as to the method of her worship, the Puja. The cursory way in which these elements are dealt with in the text is inversely proportional to their importance and relevance for the Sri Vidya as a tantric tradition. And re the reason for such summary treatment of these topics in the Mahatmya Kanda might have been explained by the presence of a section of the work dedicated to a detailed discussion of the ritual matters, if the now lost Charya Kanda had ever existed. However, by hypothesizing that a Charya Kanda had never existed, an issue that I discuss elsewhere, the brevity and imprecision of their treatment might instead be considered congruous with the general character of the Tripura Rahasya, a work belonging to a hybrid literary genre in which tantric and Puranic elements are blended in an original way. This peculiarity of the Tripura Rahasya accords with the phenomenon evident in medieval India, 
whereby, as remarked by Alexis Sanderson, uh, the tantric and Puranic domains tend to merge due to the tendency of the tantrics to permeate the field of popular religion and of the non-tantric devotional traditions to expand into a domain beyond their own. Diksha. At the beginning of the Mahatmya Kanda, Parashurama imparts the initiation to his uh, disciple Sumedha Aritayana, who is the alleged author of the work. According to the relevant passage, which is given in the handout, both in Sanskrit and in my English translation, uh, the ceremony begins with the worship of the goddess installed on her throne. But the text does not specify whether it is an external rite performed on a cult image or an internal worship mentally performed by the guru. After this, some of the chief rites pertaining to a tantric initiation are either mentioned or alluded to in the text. The first is the communication of the mantra whispered by the guru into the ear of the disciple. Mastering a mantra is generally deemed to enable the adept to acquire extra extraordinary powers, siddhis, or as is probable in this case, to perform the ritual worship of the god. The second element is the cutting of the three bones, the pasha, that is to say the elimination of the impurities called mala, which keep the disciple's soul in the state of bondage. Release from these bonds fulfills one of the main purifying functions of a salvific diksha. The third element is the nyasa, which is the ritual imposition of the mantra on various body parts of the disciple, who is thus impregnated with the power of the mantra and is thereby transformed and divinized. The fourth element mentioned in the text is the oblation of the three tattvas in the fire of one's own self in the words of the text. And this probably refers to a complex ritual the performance of which varies according to different tantric traditions. The three tattvas, as Helen Brunner um, commented in a publication of 1977, are to be understood as clusters of entities whose upgrade gate encompasses the whole universe. So these are these three tattvas are the basis of the initiation called Nirvana Diksha, which consists in clearing each level of the cosmos of all karma that the candidate could ever experience. The text of the Tripura Rahasya seems to allude to the general pattern of the Nirvana Diksha, representing the purification of the three tattvas as the result of their being offered and burnt as an oblation in the fire of consciousness, with which one's own self is to be identified. Uh, besides the mantra of the goddess, the disciple is said to be instructed in her yantra, the Shri Chakra, which is alluded to in the word of the text as uh, her form adorned with the threefold support. The Shri Chakra consisting in fact of three main constituent parts. And finally, he is, uh, the can candidate is expected to learn the Charya, which includes the rules of conduct related to uh, Raito's social behavior and the religious observances of the initiate, and also the achara, which is the method of ritual practice. Now, charya and achara generally constitute the core of the so-called samaya diksha, 
which is the preliminary initiation that qualifies the candidate to follow the ordinary religious obligations of a given tantric tradition. It is obvious that this passage uh, um, of the Tripura Rahasya, which is the only one dealing with the Diksha in the work, provides a scanty and inaccurate description of this ceremony. To begin with, there is a dearth of information about which type of Diksha among the sub-varieties of this rite it is. The ritual described in the Tripura Rahasya is not comparable with the ceremony uh, bequeathed in the sources of the early South India Tripura tradition, such as, for instance, the uh, <clears throat> Gyana Pipa Vimarshini, a padati written by uh, Shivananda's near contemporary Vidyananda, uh, 12. Uh, 1225, 1275, which has been analyzed by Madhu Kanna in her unpublished study, The Concept and Liturgy of the Sri Chakra, based on Shivananda's trilogy. So the, the ritual described in the Tripura Rahasya is, is not comparable. Um, with that uh, described in this text. And even the description of the Diksha given in the Lalito Pakyana, which is the major Puranic source on which, as I have shown elsewhere, the Mahatmya Kanda of the Tripura Rahasya is based. So even the Lalito Pakyana is much more detailed than the Tripura Rahasya. Uh, the Lalitopakyana is an ap uh, appendix added to the Brahmanda Purana, uh, which was probably composed in Kanchi in the early 13th century. Then a comparison between the present text and the relevant passages from the above mentioned works, which is beyond the scope of the present lecture, of course, shows how the Tripura Rahasya is limited to mentioning only some of the chief steps of a tantric initiation, implying their purposes, without giving any detail about the concrete performance of the rite. Accordingly, the purifying function of the Diksha is fulfilled by the cutting of the three bones, and the purification of the three tattvas and, and the purification of the three tattvas, sorry, and her uh, transformative function is served by the nyasa. And moreover, whereas the instruction regarding charya and achara aims at introduce, introduce, uh, introducing, sorry, introducing the candidate into the community of the initiates, making him a samayin, and on the other hand, the salvific virtue of the diksha is realized by the revelation of the mantra and the yantra of the goddess, thus enable, enabling the initiate to pursue the sadhana, the spiritual discipline leading to liberation. The way in which the Tripura Rahasya deals with uh, so crucial a rite as the Diksha highlights the general attitude of the text towards ritual. Its aim is not so much to provide concrete and detailed ritual prescriptions as to point instead to the main features and purposes of the ritual in question. The mantra the uh, Pancha Dasha Akshari. The mantra of the goddess, the Shri Vidya, which should be uh, communicated during the initiation, initiation uh, ceremony, is provided in the Mahatmya Kanda of the Tripura Rahasya within a narrative framework, namely in the episode regarding Kamadeva. The text recounts that Tripura, taking the form of Lakshmi, appeared to Kama in a dream and revealed to him her vidya, so her mantra, 
consisting of 15 syllables, the Panchadasha Akshari. The mantra, which is said to be concealed in the hymn of her 108 names, is disclosed in the text in encoded form. In fact, the stotra, so the hymn of her uh, of the 108 names of the goddess, which provides a key to decoding the mantra, is acrostic, in the sense that the 108 names of Tripura can be divided into nine series, where the epithets appearing in each of these series begin with the same letter. These letters do not themselves form the Vidya, as is, for instance, the case of the Lalita Trishati Stotra, a Stotra which was recently translated and annotated by Alexis Sanderson. But these letters help in the Tripura Rahasa in um, deciphering her encoded description, which is the passage is given in the handout. And uh, the mantra disclosed by this encoded formulation is ka e i la hrim, ha sa ka ha la hrim, sa ka la hrim. Therefore, the Tripura Rahasya follows the so-called Kadimata form of the Srividya, so beginning with Ka, in the tradition of Kamaraja. And uh, the text does so in the same way as the Nitya Shodashika Arnava Tantra, and another seminal source uh, together with the Yogini Hrdaya of the tradition of Tripura, uh, the Lalitopakyana, and also the Lalita Trishati Stotra. It should be noted that uh, unlike the Lalita Pakyana, the Tripura Rahasya does not give any information about the practice of the Vidya and its results. But uh, the text is limited to praising the hymn of the 108 names and uh, its recitation is regarded as a, a religious obligation for the adepts of the Sri Vidya who have to recite it daily and during the regular and occasional rites. The rewards gained through this recitation, it is said in the text, range from the fulfillment of all desires to the attainment after death of the abode of the goddess. Uh, the Shodasha Akshari. Although the Panchadasha Akshari in either one of her two variants, which are the Kadimata and also the Hadimata, so beginning with the letter Ha, uh, so al although this mantra is considered to be the chief mantra of Tripura, there is, there is also a 16-syllable form of the Srividya, which is called the Shodasha Akshari. Like the Panchadasha Akshari, the Shodasha Akshari is also presented in the Tripura Rahasya within a narrative context. So one reads that Lakshmi once propitiated Tripura for a long time yearning for complete union, Sayuja, with her. Pleased by her worship, Tripura claimed that their natures were the same and said that her own Vidya, the Panchadasha Akshari, was completed only by the addition of Lakshmi's auspicious phonic seed, Bija, which is Shrim thus becoming the great mantra of Sri made of 16 syllables, the Maha Shri Shodasha Akshari. The passage in which um, Tripura um, gave this speech to Lakshmi is, is given in the handout. The close affinity between Tripura and Lakshmi which is asserted in the Tripura Rahasya is to be understood in the context of the interplay between tantric traditions and 
Puranic popular religion in medieval India. This, this interplay had an impact on the relationships between Tantric and Puranic deities in general and goddesses in particular. The Tripura Rahasya provides a good instance of this phenomenon. The identity of Tripura that emerges from the picture provided by the Tripura Rahasya is in fact complex. Philosophically, she is identified with the supreme consciousness. Theologically, she is regarded as the great goddess, the Mahadevi, subsuming the other goddesses to be considered as her manifestations or shares. And accordingly, her figure absorbs those of local goddesses, such as Lalita and Kamakshi of Kanchi, as well as those of mainstream Hindu goddesses like Sri Lakshmi. In the passage in question, the assimilation with Sri Lakshmi fulfills the purpose of and enhancing the saumya, so the gentle, benevolent features of Tripura herself. And this provides the theological justification for the importance attributed to the Shodasha Akshari. As the, we can say that as the virtues of Lakshmi crown the figure of Tripura, so Lakshmi's bija, Shrim, completes her vidya the Panchadasha Akshari forming the Shodasha Akshari. But in so do doing, the Tripura Rahasya complies also with those lineages of the Shrividya tradition, which are testified uh, in the Lalitopakyana and recorded also by Bhaskara Raya, the scholar and Shakta devotee uh, who lived in Maharashtra between 1690 and 1785. Uh, so in these um, lines of the tradition where the Shodasha Akshari is said to be formed by the addition of the Bija Shrim to the Panchadasha Akshari. The handling of the mantras in the Tripura Rahasya indicates that the author or authors, this is still questionable of the work was or were well aware of their essential importance uh, and also of the method of setting, setting them forth in a traditional encoded form. However, no space is devoted in the text to speculation about the esoteric meanings of the Shri Vidya, topics which are instead extensively elaborated in the Yogini Hridaya, as well as in the works of later <clears throat> exegetes of the tradition, such as, for instance, the Kamakala Vilasa by Punya Ananda, who was the guru of Amrta Ananda, uh, lived around um, in, in the 14th century, uh, and the Varivasya Rahasya by Bhaskara Raya. So as in the case of the initiation, so also in the domain of the mantras, the Tripura Rahasya limits itself to indicating what, what ought to be done, performing the Diksha, knowing the Vidya, without concretely detailing how to do it, and especially without discussing the meanings of the ritual element described. Puja. <clears throat> Before examining how the cult of Tripura, the puja, is handled in the Mahatmya Kanda of the Tripura Rahasya, we have to take into account how the relationship between Tantric and Vedic rituals is considered in the text. This issue is in fact discussed in the penultimate chapter of the Mahatmya Kanda, where it is declared that ultimately there is no difference between Veda and Tantra. Nevertheless, it is said, whereas Vedic ritual aims only at the fulfillment of worldly goals, Tantric ritual brings about 
worldly enjoyment, bhukti, extraordinary powers, siddhi, and liberation, moksha. The tantric method is therefore to be regarded as superior to the Vedic. There is nothing original in these statements of the Tripura Rahasya. Attempts to accommodate the tantric and the Vedic, as remarked by Padu in a publication of 1994, date back to, I quote, the process of Brahmanization of the old tantric cults and reciprocally the tantrization of the Brahmanic milieu, unquote. <clears throat> so these attempts uh, uh, in the case of the Tripurara tradition uh, was already present in Kashmir and de developed in the later stages of the South India Srividya, which was affected, as we know, by the influence of the Smarta Brahma. Uh, accordingly, the presence of Vedic elements is detectable in the narrative of the Mahatmya Kanda in two episodes in which the gods, seeking protection from the demon Bhanda, propitiate Tripura by performing a great sacrifice, a Mahayaga in which Vedic and Tantric features are blended and whose outcome is the manifestation of the goddess out of the sacrificial fire of consciousness, the Chid Agni, burning in the fire pit located on the altar. The source on which these episodes are based is uh, the Lalitopakhyana where in the same uh, circumstances, Lalita is said to arise from the fire of a great sacrifice, a Maha Yaga Analat. Here too, the ritual described in the text combines Vedic and Tantric elements. Mm -hmm. Leaving aside for now a detailed comparison between the relevant passages of the two texts, we may at least remark that the presence of this hybrid ritual, which is imagined to be performed not by human devotees in our world, but by the gods in a mythic context, uh, might have been meant by the authors of the Tripura Rahasya as a means to exemplifying with a vivid narrative device on the one hand, the statement of principle that there was no difference between Veda and Tantra. And on the other hand, the actual integration of Vedic elements in Tantric ritually. Um, another example of a, a ritual performed by a divine devotee in which the balance between Vedic and Tantric uh, components is weighted towards the latter, is found in another episode of the Mahatmya Kanda, where uh, Gauri venerates a cult image of Tripura by offering the prescribed services, the Upachara, and she eulogizes the goddess with both Vedic and Tantric hymns. Concluding her puja, Gauri meditates on Tripura, and as she becomes one with the object of her meditation, the goddess appears before her. So as one can see, some of the chief characteristics of a Tantric puja are mentioned here, and namely the homage paid to the cult image, and the visualizing meditation bringing about the identification of the devotee with the deity. Beside these rituals, which are performed by deities and described within a diverse narrative context, the prescriptions relating to the method of worship of Tripura by her human devotees are given in the last chapter of the Mahatmya Kanda. 
The contents of this chapter are not, however, comparable with the highly elaborate and complex descriptions of the Sri Chakra Puja to be found in the early scriptural, scriptural sources such as the Nitya Shodashikar Navatantra <clears throat> and the Yogini Hridaya, and also in the exegetical works and compendia of the Tripura tradition. As the comprehensive and detailed analysis of the Shri Chakra Puja provided by Sanjukta Gupta in a publication of 1979 and by Madhu Khanna in um, her already mentioned thesis of 1986 have shown. So the, the contents of the Tripura Rahasya chapter is, is not uh, absolutely comparable um, with such descriptions. Uh, now the chapter in question uh, begins by mentioning but not detailing the regular worship of Tripura, which is called Aradhana, Nitya Kriya, that is to say the Nitya Puja, the daily worship which constitutes the prime religious obligation for any tantric initiate. In the Tripura tradition, the core of this private rite is the Shri Chakra Puja, which is the adoration of Tripura and of her surrounding deities the uh, so-called Avarana Devatas on the Shri Chakra, which is both the diagrammatic form of the goddess, the symbol of her cosmic activity, and the mental and material support for her cult. The complex meditative yogic ritual practices involved in the Shri Chakra Puja are only alluded to in the text of the Tripura Rahasya. And moreover, essential parts of the puja, such as the nyasa, uh, the transformative ritual consisting in placing the divine energy on the body of the worshiper, and the japa, which is the meditative repetition of the shrividya. So these essential elements are not mentioned in the text. However, there are several indications that the author uh, is or are aware that the Sri Chakra Puja was the core of the Puja, of the cult of Tripura. There follows in, in this chapter a rather detailed description of a special ritual, a so-called Vishesha Karman, which is suitable for rich people and is to be performed in a temple where either a Shri Chakra or a cult image of the goddess should be duly installed and consecrated. The reward expected after death by those who are variously involved in temple worship is said to be the attainment of a place in the abode of the goddess in her city which is called Shripura. And finally, the text illustrates the merits acquired by other pious deeds. It, it may be interesting to consider briefly uh, some problems that are raised by the description of this uh, special ritual. While some important step, steps of the ritual worship of the cult image of the goddess are mentioned in the text, such as the offering of services, the upachara, and the repetition of the divine names, certain essential elements are instead omitted, such as the bhuta shuddhi, which is the preliminary purification of the worshipper, or the antaryaga, the internal worship that generally precedes the external worship, and again the japa of the Mula Mantra of Tripura, the Shrividya. So these elements are not mentioned. 
And moreover, it is somewhat baffling to encounter here a Sarvato Bhatra Mandala, which means auspicious from all sides. And this is a diagram belonging to the category of the Bhadra Mandalas, widely used by the Smarta Brahmans. So in the text of the uh, Tripura Rahasya, this mandala occurs, but in a hybrid form, where its original pattern is modified according to a Shakta adaptation, and plays a role of its own in the cult, without overshadowing the importance of the Sri Chakras. So the occurrence of the Sarvatobhadra is further proof of the mutual influence between Smarta and Tantric components of the late Sri Vidya tradition. But unfortunately, no information is given in the text about the reason for its present in, uh, presence in the ritual, nor about its relation with the Sri Chakra. It is that apparent that even from such a brief sampling of the problems contained in the text, how difficult is the task task of drawing a coherent picture of this, of this Vishesha Karma, of this special ritual. So in, in summary, considered as a whole, this ritual chapter of the Tripura Rahasya touches upon a variety of topics, which had they been adequately discussed, could have provided comprehensive information about the ritual uh, practices of the adepts of the Sri Vidya. However, the cursory way in which these topics are dealt with, along with the lacune uh, about important matters, result in an incomplete and incoherent picture. Incidentally, uh, a comparison with the Lalitopakyana immediately highlights the shortcomings of the Tripura Rahasya. Those chapters of the Lalitopakyana dealing with the worship of Tripura and of the Sri Chakra reveal in fact that even a Puranic text like the Lalitopakyana is much more developed and detailed than the Tripura Rahasya, both in the description of the ritual practices and the discussion of their meaning. The text of the Lalitopakyana focuses chiefly on the very subjects that are overlooked by the Tripura Rahasya, namely the japa of the Shodasha Akshari, the prescriptions about the various ritual hand gestures, the mudras, and the identifying meditation, the dhyana on, tripura, on Lalita, uh, associated with various types of nyasas. There are, sorry, there are <clears throat> two possible explanations for this. The first is that the contents of this chapter of the Tripura Rahasya may simply have been intended as a preview of topics treated more thoroughly in the missing section of the work, the Chadiakanda. However, the very presence of this ritual chapter at the end of the Mahatmya Kanda would seem to render unnecessary a further section of the work devoted to ritual matters. Therefore, the second and more convincing possibility is that the ritual issues were not crucial to the author of the Tripura Rahasya, as is also apparent in the soteriology propounded by the work, according to which knowledge is much more important than ritual as a means of liberation. So if, if this, the latter, were indeed the case, the mere uh, allusion to a certain ritual far from being regarded as a lacuna, may have been considered sufficient information for the practitioners of the Shri Vidya 
for whom the method of performing the ritual in question was taken for granted and who would therefore have been able to fill in the gaps in the text. Manivita and Sri Chakra. These brief remarks about ritual in the Tripura Rahasya show that the Sri Chakra, which together with the Sri Vidya, plays a crucial role in the cult of Tripura, receives little attention in the ritual portions of the work. Its importance is only highlighted in the second part of the Mahatmya Kanda, the Lalita Mahatmya, a, a section which celebrates the deeds of Lalita considered to be the highest and fullest of Tripura's forms. In the Lalita Mahatmya, the Sri Chakra is transposed into a narrative element becoming the center of the abode of Tripura in the island of jewels, the Manidvipa, as well as the pattern according to which Shripura, the city stronghold of Lalita, is constructed. We shall see how the Manidvipa and the Shri Chakra retain they, their tantric character and meaning, even as they are incorporated into a mythical narrative. The Lalita Mahatmya narrates that when the gods of the Trimurti were created by the goddess and appointed to perform their respective co cosmic functions, they entreated Tripura to assume a visible form that they might worship. And to comply with their request, Tripura consented to appear in the island of jewels, located in the midst of the ocean of nectar. Her abode, a mansion made of gems, yielding all desires, so the Chintamani Grha, and rising in the center of the island, becomes in a subsequent point of the narrative, the mold of Sripura, the residence of Lalita built for her by Vishvakarman on the top of Mount Meru. The description of the island of jewels given in the Lalita Mahatmya of the Tripura Rahasya is based on the longer and more detailed description of Sripura in the Lalitopakyan, as well as on that of the Manidvipa found in the Devi Bhagavata Purana. Uh, the latter is a Purana from northeastern India probably composed, uh, according to Mackenzie Brown, a publication of 1990, between the 11th and the 12th centuries and completed in its final reduction during the following four of or five centuries of the current era. A mention must also be made of the tantric sources which may have inspired the authors of the Tripura Rahasya in their description of the island of jewels. And namely, uh, these sources are the Parashurama Kalpa Sutra, which is a ritual handbook dating from around the 15th and 16th uh, centuries, and the uh, Kularnava Tantra, so the Tantra of the ocean of the Kula tradition, dating from sometime after the 12th century of the current era. So both of these texts belong to what Alexis Sanderson labels as the later developments of the Kula Marga and specifically of the Tripura tradition. Their outline of the island of jewels, those much less detailed than the those given in the Puranic sources, corresponds in broad terms to that of the Tripura Rahasya and of its uh, Puranic sources. 
but these two tantric texts clearly hold the Manidvita to be a yanka, and accordingly they provide the instructions for the related meditation. Now, in the, in the Tripura Rahasya, Lalitopakyana and Devi Bhagavata Purana, the innermost dwelling place of the goddess in the Manidvipa, or in Sripura in the case of the Lalitopakyana, is surrounded by a series of ramparts, the spaces between which are inhabited by various deities. Proceeding from the exterior towards the interior, a first series of ramparts composed of increasingly precious metals is followed by a series of ramparts made of increasingly precious gems. Unlike the Devi Bhagavata Purana, in the Tripura Rahasya and in the Lalitopakyana, the names of the successive ramparts, which are called Manas, mind, Buddhi, intellect, and Ahamkara, egoity, clearly indicate that what is being described is not only the mythical abode of the goddess, but is also, and above all, a yanka. Accordingly, it is implied that in his meditative path, the adept should progress through and beyond the boundaries of his limited individual consciousness, represented by Manas, Buddhi, and Ahamkara, to realize his final identification with the supreme consciousness personified by the goddess dwelling in the center of the mystical island. Then, uh, continuing the description, beyond the ramparts of the sun and the moon, reaching the innermost enclosure in both uh, Tripura Rahasya and Lalitopakyana, inside the rampart of love, the Shringara, made of Kaustuba gems, is a moat filled with pure erotic sentiment or sap the Sharingara Rasa. And this moat is presided by Kamadeva. It may be worth noting that the relevant passage of the Lalitopakyana suggests that only those who are capable of experiencing the joy promised by the ever-deluding Lord of Desire, Kama, while at the same time maintaining their inner clarity of mind, can cross this moat and approach the core of the Manidvipa. At this point, in both Tripura Rahasya and Lalitopakyana, the description begins of the innermost abode of the goddess and her consort. Whereas in the Devi Bhagavata Purana, uh, the description of this abode follows directly that of the enclosures of metals and gems. In the Tripura Rahasya, beyond the Sringara rampart is the grove of the great lotus, the Mahapadma Vana, where the mansion of Tripura stands made of gems yielding all desires, the Chintamani Gadha. In its center, on a throne formed by the five great gods, who are Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, Ishvara, and Sada Shiva, the throne is called Pancha Brahma Atmamanchaka, Tripura sits on the left thigh of Kamishvara. In the parallel description of the Lalitopakyana, the Chintamani Gurha is said to be the great dwelling of the chief of the chakras, that is the Shri Chakra. We might thus assert that what the Lalitopakyana is describing is a yantra, the Shri Chakra, inside another yantra, Shri Pura or the Manidvipa. 
And from the viewpoint of the meditating adept, the, the visualization of the island of jewels or of Sharipura with all its wondrous vivid features is to be regarded as a preparation for the contemplation of the goddess in her more abstract, aniconic form, that is the Sharika. As regards the Devi Bhagavata Purana, it will suffice to point, to point out some significant details that reveal the influence of the Tripura tradition on this Puranic text. The fact that the goddess and her consort who are dwelling in the Chintamani Gurkha are represented with the attributes characteristic of Tripura and Kameshvara indicates that the Supreme Devi celebrated in this Purana is to be identified with Tripura. Moreover, the connection of the Chintamani Griha with the Shri Chakra is recognizable by the statement of the Devi Bhagavata Purana that the former contracts and expands at the times of dissolution and creation of the universe. A statement which indeed applies to the dynamic nature of the Shri Chakra conceived as the throbbing model of the divine energy manifesting and reabsorbing all things. Now, returning to the Tripura Rahasya, the link between the Manidvipa and the Shri Chakra is articulated once again by means of a narrative device. It is recounted that when Tripura showed herself to the gods, she was sitting on her throne with her consort Kameshvara and, and the gods prompted her to have a retinue, a parivara. Hence, she created Maha Tripura Sundari out of her own body as a reflection of herself, Pratibimbavat, he said, and appointed her to create a Shakti Chakra with, with, his, with its uh, uh, circles of surrounding Shaktis or goddesses, so a Shakti Avarana, to form her retinue. So what is expressed here in the form of a narrative incident, in fact, refers to the process of emanation by the divine energy of the Shri Chakra and of the deities abiding in its constituent parts. As Padu explains, I quote, the apparition of the Shri Chakra is therefore described in terms of a cosmic process that simultaneously manifests the geometric pattern of the Shri Chakra and brings about the apparition of the deities that abide in the chakra and animate, name manifested by their power. Unquote from a publication of 2013. To continue with the collation of the relevant passages from the Tripura Rahasa and the Lalito Pakyana, it can be seen that the text of the Tripura Rahasya outlines the geometric pattern of the Shri Chakra, which is endowed with the pyramidal structure. It then adds that this was created by Tripura as the abode for the Shaktis at the request of Maha Tripura Sundari. In the Lalitopakyana, the deities forming the retinue of Lalita are located on places called Antara, ascending along the pyramidal structure of the Chintamani Grha, which, as already mentioned, is said to be the abode of the Shri Chakra and is therefore to be identified with this. A Comparative analysis of the distribution of the deities on the Shri Chakra in the Tripura Rahasya and in the Lalito Pakyana 
shows that the names, characteristics, and places of these deities largely correspond in these two texts and also match the paradigm of the Yugrni Hrdaya, which may be considered as the reference source for the Sri Chakra Puja, which is the cult of Tripura Sundari and the goddesses of her retinue surrounding her and dwelling on the Sri Chakra. But as regards the ritual meditative yogic aspects of the cult of these deities, whose esoteric significance is highly elaborated in the Yogini Hrdaya, all this remains unspoken or at best implicit in both Tripura Rahasya and Lalitopakyana. In the Puranic quasi-epic perspective of the Lalitopakyana, the Chintamani Grha alias Sri Chakra is not regarded as a yantra whose deities are to be meditated upon and worshipped, but is presented as the stronghold of Lalita, from which she launches her attacks against the demon Banda. In addition, the war chariot of the goddess called the Chakra Raja Rata, so chariot in the form of the chief of the chakras, and endowed with nine steps, has the ninefold structure of the Sri Chakra. And in fact, the same groups of Shaktis found in the ascending abodes of the Chintamani Grha are distributed on the corresponding steps of the war chariot of the goddess. So the Lalitopakyana has thus incorporated the model of the Sri Chakra from, from the Tantric sources, replacing the ritual prescriptions given by these sources with its vivid depictions of the divine abodes with their inhabitants and of the chariot uh, of the warrior goddess Lalita. And in so doing, the Lalitopakyana provides a good instance of how the phenomenon of the flow between the Tantric and the Puranic words may result in an original syncretic synthesis of elements taken from both domains. This also holds true for the Tripura Rahasya, but in a different perspective, in the sense that the Tantric component seems to be predominant and to mold the Puranic character of this work. Unlike the Lalitopakyana, the Tripura Rahasya defines the geometric pattern of the Sri Chakra clearly. Uh, the description of the places of the Shaktis on its structure seems scanty if compared with the descriptions of the Lalitopakyana. But the Tripura Rahasya expands on the outward appearance of the deities of each group detailing their attributes. And although the iconographic features of these deities do not always match with their parallels in the Yogini Hrdaya, the fact that details characterizing the stula form, so the visible form of these deities are provided, reveals an awareness that they should be mentally visualized or contemplated by the adept on the fashioned image of the Sri Chakra during its ritual worship. So while, while uh, retaining thus <clears throat> the tantric character of its description of the abode of Tripura in the Manidvipa and of her retinue uh, of Shaktis located on the Sri Chakra, the Tripura Rahasya, like the Lalitopakyana, includes these descriptions in, a, in the narrative of the fight of Lalita against the demon Banda. But in the, <clears throat> in the case of the Tripura Rahasya, the accounts of the deed of Lalita can be said to be framed entirely within the Sri Chakra. In fact, from the point of view of the structure of the text, this account is inserted 
between the initial descriptions of the Manidvipa and of Tripura retinues, and the final celebration of the victory of Lalita, who is enthroned as queen of Shripura, the city built for her on the peak of Mount Meru, according to the modern of the original abode of Tripura in the center of the island of Jewels. After her royal consecration, Lalita is installed on a splendid Sri Chakra-like throne formed by the five great gods, beginning with Brahma. Hence, a throne which is like that of Sripura in the island of Jewels, and which is itself qualified as the Sri Chakra. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>